Good morning and uh, welcome to this session, uh, Containers a Look Under the Hood. My name is Gerlof Langeveld. I'm employed by the Dutch company AT Computing, where I am a trainer in my daily work, uh, giving courses about Linux, uh, giving courses about uh, Docker, Kubernetes, and uh, uh, that kind of uh, um, uh, courses and trainings. Uh, for this session, um, we will have an interactive session at uh, certain moments. Uh, we are going to try to make a container uh, without using a container implementation, one of the known implementations. And if you want to join, you can join by downloading uh, that um, tar file. So if you didn't do it, you can uh, do it. Uh, there is a, a, a small environment in which we are going to make an, uh, a container. And there are also some tools in there that might be beneficial uh, during this session, but also maybe later on. If we have a look at uh, the conventional Unix approach, uh, if, if we have a look at processes there, uh, then we can see that all the processes that run in one uh, system, in one host, uh, run in one ecosystem as well. They have the same environment. They have an unambiguous notion of what is the host name of this system. Uh, they have one uh, PIT numbering scheme uh, that they all use, all the processes on the system. Uh, all the Processors on the system have the same view of the file system and all the mounted uh, physical file systems in the logical file system tree. Uh, they have the same notion about the network stack, what are the open ports, what are the interfaces being used. They have the same notion about inter-process communication objects like shared memory and message queues and uh, semaphores. And they also have the same notion about uh, usernames and user IDs, the mapping of usernames on, on user IDs. Um, that's, that's the classical approach, the conventional approach. Um, what was already there uh, since a few decades was the fact that every process could have its own ID of what is my root directory. That was not necessarily the root directory of the entire file system but every process could have its own root directory somewhere in the file system and only be able to, to use that part of the file system as that process's file system. Uh, in the conventional approach, uh, we also see that the root identity means that you can do all the privileged actions, um, reboot the file system, uh, reboot the system, um, uh, change the hardware clock, that kind of things. Uh, and, and processes with non-root identity have no privileged uh, possibility for no privileged actions at all. And in the conventional approach, we see that it's hardly possible to control the resource consumption. Uh, there was hardly any limit to put a maximum on the CPU um, utilization that you have, or you cannot guarantee a minimum uh, CPU uh, utilization or memory utilization. Uh, that was all not possible in the conventional approach. If we have a look at the containerized approach, we can see that processes in the container um, are isolated from the other processes on the host, uh, which means that they run with an, uh, an own meeting file system inside the container. Yeah, that's what you see in this picture. Uh, this is one host system with the host file system. And on that, we can run a container. In that container, we have our own mini file system. Uh, the container has its own ID of what is my host name inside the container, yeah, apart from the host on which it runs. Uh, it has its own private uh, PID numbering, process IDs. Uh, it has its own private network stack uh, with its own open ports and its own, its own interfaces. Uh, it has it might have limited uh, privileges, uh, even if a process in the container is running as uh, under root identity, it doesn't mean that it can do anything or everything, I should say. Um, and you can, uh, when you work with containers, uh, but that's also possible outside containers, you can also uh, limit or guarantee a certain resource consumption. 
yeah, CPU consumption, memory consumption, for instance. So how does that work? That uh, processes in a container uh, have their own view of what is my environment, what is my host name, what is my file system, uh, and that kind of things. Well, if often when I give uh, classes about containers, uh, I notice that people have an idea about the container that once you start a container that some magic box is created and that box is uh, furnished with um, a mini file system and a private network and a PIT number generator specifically for this box. And in the end, the process will be loaded into the box and the process will be kicked off and it can do its work. Yeah, and as it says on the slide, uh, this is the unrealistic view of what is a container. That's not how it works. So what is a more realistic view? Um, if we have a look at an existing process, a process is connected, um, is, is bound to namespaces. Yeah, and the namespaces determine what the environment uh, of, of the process is, what, it's, what is its view on the file system, uh, how about its uh, PIT numbering, uh, and that kind of things. Um, that's determined by namespaces, and we can also see that the process is connected to C groups, control groups, that can be used to uh, minimize uh, or, or maximize the CPU util utilization or guarantee a certain minimum of CPU ut utilization. And a process also has an idea about what is my root directory. And what you see in a normal host without using containers is that if this process creates a new process, which will be a, a child process, that the child process inherits all the bounding, uh, binding to the namespaces and the control groups. Uh, it also inherits the ID of what is my root directory in the file system. Uh, that's all inherited. But when we uh, are going to start a containerized process, uh, then we can see, well, we still have an existing process. It's connected to all kinds of namespaces and it has an ID of a root directory and control groups. But the child process, which is forked off, uh, that might have its own namespaces. And via these namespaces, the child might have its own idea of what is my host name and what is my file system and what, uh, what about my PIT numbers and that kind of things. Yeah, so uh, it might also have its own idea about what is my root directory and its own connection to control groups. And this, this picture, you can see that all the things are separated. That's not necessarily what's, what's the case. Uh, it might be that the uh, child process still shares certain namespaces with the parent and other namespaces might not be shared. So if we have a look at these namespaces to which the process is connected, um, then we can find a namespace that determines the host name for the process. And that's what we call the UTS namespace. There's a namespace that determines what are the inter-process communication objects for this process, message queues and that kind of things, IPC namespace, uh, there is a PIT numbering namespace, a network namespace, uh, a mount namespace yeah, that determines how the file system looks like. There are user namespaces um, and yeah, that determines the environment of the process. Furthermore, a process can have a private mini file system uh, that's done by techniques like change root and pivot root. We will see more about that later on. And uh, a process might have its own distinct privileges, yeah, which is uh, uh, maintained by the kernel mechanism capabilities. Furthermore, uh, as we have seen in the picture before, processes are connected to C groups, control groups, and there are particular C groups that can be used to guarantee a certain resource consumption or to maximize a certain resource consumption. As you see, certain things are grayed out here. Uh, the things that are grayed out, I'm not going to talk about. Uh, I hope to, to uh, have enough time to handle the other things uh, that are not grayed out here. Yeah, so as I said at the beginning, uh, the goal of this presentation is that we are going to create a containerized process uh, without using Docker or Podman or whatever implementation of that. Yeah, just by using 
these namespaces and, and private uh, file systems ourselves. Before we are going to look at uh, the namespaces in detail, uh, just a few words about the proc file system that we also need this morning. Um, probably you already know there is a pseudo file system called proc, yeah, which is mounted on usually the slash proc directory. And underneath you will find certain pseudo files, which are not really files, but uh, via these files you can uh, watch kernel administration, yeah, kernel data. And um, there, are, there are system level kernel data, such as the uh, pseudo file proc, uh, procstat that you can use. Uh, but there's also data on process level that you can find, find under, uh, underneath the slash proc directory. And uh, for every running process at this moment, you will find a subdirectory underneath slash proc. And that subdirectory has the PID of the running process as name. Yeah, so what you see in this example is uh, if I have a look at my processes here, my shell is running with this PID and then I can have a look underneath slash proc at that PID as a subdirectory where I can find uh, the contents of yeah, all kind of information that is related to this process. Yeah, you can see there and I can also show it uh, on the system. Um, I can, of course, also use as the PID of my shell dollar dollar. If I go to that directory, uh, you can see that there are a lot of files and subdirectories even, and they all contain information about this process. Uh, one of the most famous files that holds a lot of information is the file stat. Uh, but for this, you need, uh, of course, a, a description. What does it mean, all these, these figures? Uh, you can guess a bit at the beginning that you can find the name and, and the state of the process and that kind of things. But for the rest, you, uh, you need the man page of PROC to see what all the other things are meaning in there. Uh, there is a pseudo file here, which is more human readable. And that is the status file. And I will use that later on in my session as well. And there you can see yeah, more human readable data about what is the name of the process and the UMask and the, the PID and that kind of things. I'll come back to that later on. So let's have a closer look at namespaces. Uh, how can we use them and, and how are they uh, managed? So namespaces allow processes to share a dedicated collection of resources like host names and process IDs. I mentioned them already. And every type of namespace has its own behavior. Yeah, um, you can see that PIT namespaces behave different uh, than UTS namespaces and so on. And we will uh, have a look at them one by one and see how they work. Uh, in general, um, if you want to create new namespaces as a process, then you need the capsys admin capability. Well, for now, in other words, you have to be uh, a root uh, to be able to, to uh, create more namespaces, except for a user namespace. There, you don't need to be root. Uh, and this uh, really allows separation of groups of processes without allocating VMs. Yeah, it's the, the basis of. Uh, making containers. So if we have a look, uh, then we can see that the first process, process one, which is usually uh, system D, that the first process connects to namespaces, yeah, like the mount namespace and the pit namespace and the network namespace and the IPC namespace and the UTS namespace for the host name. And um, it, it will also be uh, um, filled and, and uh, initialized by system D, these namespaces. So at the moment that system D starts creating new processes, child processes, then these child processes will inherit the connection to those namespaces. And by that, such a child process has the same view on the file system and the same is in the same uh, PIT numbering scheme uh, and has the same host name as system D. And if that child process creates by its own uh, grandchild processor, processes and even more grand-grandchild processes, they all inherit the binding with these same namespaces, having the same view on the system as system D has. But what you can do as a process 
is that you at a certain moment say, I don't want to, uh, I don't want my connection anymore with the UTS namespace, for instance. Uh, I want to have my own UTS namespace, and there I will fill my own host name, and that is my host name for, from this moment on. Yeah, uh, while the other processes are still working with the uh, initial UTS namespace and have their own opinion about what is the, the host name. Yeah, and similar things can be done for the mount namespace and the IPC namespace and so on. So how do I know if certain processes in my systems uh, are connected to the name namespace? Yeah, and have the same idea about what is the, the, the file system and, and my host name and so on. Well, if you look underneath the slash proc file system in the proc uh, directory of a certain process, there you can see a subdirectory which is called ns, namespaces. And in that subdirectory, you will see symlinks, at least this is how they are represented as symlinks in this uh, pseudo file system. And there you can see the names of those namespaces with a reference to a specific magic inode number. Yeah? And this inode number doesn't have any meaning as such, and you can't use it for special purposes or so, uh, but they just identicate, uh, uh, identify a certain namespace yeah, to which this process is connected. And if you see that other processes in their proc, their PID, NS, have the same numbers here, you know that they are connected to the same uh, namespace. Yeah? And they have the same view about IPC objects and, and mount namespace and so on. So if I have a look specifically at um, my, my uh, own shell here uh, and at the UTS namespace, I can see this number. And if I have a look at uh, process one, uh, the namespace UTS, then I can see it's the same number. So they have the same idea about what is, in this case, the host name. But it might be different. So child processors, uh, as I said before, inherit the association with the namespace from their parent. Uh, and the namespace vanishes again, uh, disappears again, at the moment that all the processes that were bound to it uh, are unbound. Yeah, the processes are gone, for instance, and exited. So let's have a look at um, a small tool that I created. Uh, before I show the tool, which is also in uh, the downloaded uh, TAR archive, by the way, uh, I also want for demonstration purposes to, to start uh, a containerized process via Docker. Um, just a small process. Let's do a sleep here. One, two, three. Yeah, then we can also see it in, uh, in the output of our uh, tools. Well, there is a program that we uh, can run and we have to run it as uh, root because it, the ns subdirectory in the process directory is not uh, allowed to be, be watched by anybody. Uh, you can normally only see your own processes running under your identity. Uh, but uh, here I can run uh, the process as root and do an ns show min, and, uh, minus a yeah, to see all the processes. And what I get here, and I'm not going to go through all the output, but what you can see here at the end is that it shows uh, here the UTS um, namespace of all the processes. You can see the process ID and the process name, and you can see the number of the UTS namespace. And by comparing the numbers, you can say, okay, uh, it looks as if they are all in connected to the same namespace, these processes. Uh, and you get uh, in front of the list also the other namespaces. But uh, what I can do is that I run the same program without the minus A that shows all the namespaces and all the processes. And then I can only see the processes that deviate from system D. Yeah, so now I can see the processes that deviate according to their mount namespace and their network namespace and their PIT namespace and so on. And I can see that the process that I just started uh, via Docker uh, the containerized sleep process is connected to all kind of uh, different namespaces compared to the namespaces to which uh, system D is connected. Yeah, so they, they have their own opinion about how the system looks like. 
Um, if I scroll a little bit here, uh, you can also see that, um, that this mechanism is also used uh, uh, outside the, the container processes. So there are also other processes that, that want uh, just to have their own view on what is uh, uh, my file system, uh, my namespace, or what are my IPC objects, and so on. I am missing one that I expected here, but uh, never mind. Yeah. So that's the uh, NSO uh, NSO tool that uh, that helps you uh, finding out about these namespaces. So how can we manipulate with these namespaces? Yeah, apart from starting containers via Docker or Podman or whatever. Uh, there are standard commands uh, installed on your system that manipulate with these namespaces and uh, one of them is the unshare command. And the unshare command unshares a particular namespace. So you start the unshare command from your shell. It inherits the namespaces from your shell process. So it works with the same namespaces and then it can uh, decouple of one of the namespaces and get a namespace by its own, the unshare process. With the unshare command, you can also give a command that you really want to run in, in this uh, process. And what the unshare does is first uh, disconnect from a namespace and get a new namespace. And you can also, with the flags here, control which namespace, U for UTS, I for IPC, and so on. Uh, and then it execs um, the process that you specify, the command that you specify, it executes that in the current process. Yeah, this, so this is not a fork, it doesn't create uh, a child process by its own unshare to run the new command, but the new command is run inside the same process as unshare. Yes, similar to commands like nice and uh, uh, no help and that kind of command. Uh, it works similarly. So after th that, this command will really run with another namespace or a couple of other namespaces in one go. Another command that we can use, which is standardly available, is the nsenter command. And the nsenter command, there we can say, connect to a namespace of an already running process. Yeah, so you don't create a new namespace, but you already connect to a namespace which is already there from another process. And here again, you specify what namespace with the flags, and you specify the process uh, to which namespace you want to connect. Yeah, and uh, then again, you specify a command that should run like that. So um, here we have the other process that I specify with the PID. And uh, here I have NSenter that connects, disconnects from its own namespace and connect to the namespace of that process. And then executes the command in this process that you specify. Yeah. Um, Let's have a look at an uh, example of that. So we have seen a couple of uh, processes here which have their own namespaces. Um, let's take this one, GrownI, uh, GrownID, uh, with PID 751. It seems to have its own ID about what is the, the uh, mount namespace, uh, how does the file system look like. So if I first have a look at the mount, uh, the file system that I work with, and this is the mount namespace that I inherited via a lot of processes from system D. Uh, what I can do now is sudo nsenter. I want to connect to the mount namespace of the process with PID 751. And I want to run a shell yeah, as a command. And in the shell that is now connected to that other namespace of uh, grown ID, I can do a DF again. And I can see um, that I uh, indeed have another uh, view of the file system. Yeah, that's uh, uh, not identical. Yeah. Yeah. Um, by the way, if you think about Docker or Podman or that kind of uh, uh, implementations, this is, of course, what the docker exec command does. 
uh, that you say, uh, I have a running container and I want to start a new uh, command in there in the same environment. Well, then, uh, in fact, under the hood, uh, NS Enter is done, and you connect to all the namespaces of that process running in the container, and by that you are part of the container. Yeah, you are part of the same environment. <clears throat> Let's have a look at the specific uh, uh, behaviors of the different namespaces. First of all, let's have a look at the UTS namespace for hostname isolation. Um, if we have a look at this example, ls-l slash proc, uh, my current shell ns UTS, then I can see that this process is connected to this namespace with this number. And if I have a look at the host name, uh, I can see it's called my host. Yeah, and let's assume this is just a shell that inherits and, and forked off uh, via via uh, from system D. Well, what I can do now is that I can do a sudo unshare, unshare the UTS namespace and then load the best program in uh, the process. Uh, and then I can see that this is the prompt of my new bash program here. And if I do an ls-l of this bash, yeah, dollar dollar is now another shell, uh, UTS, I can see it has a different uh, UTS namespace number now. And here in this new namespace, uh, I can set the host name. Yeah, it inherits the same host name, but I can overrule it now by the host name command, and I can call it from now on other host. And if I would do the host name command now without parameters, I would see, would see well, the host name is other host now. I can also start another shell again, which is a child process that inherits my namespaces. And then in that child process, I can uh, again see already in the prompt that now it, uh, it, it shows its own host name in the prompt, which is other host. And I can exit from that uh, third shell process and go back to the second again that I started here, and I can exit from there. And then I'm back at the same situation here, and I can still see that that process works with my host. It's still my host and not other host. So this is a rather simple namespace, just holding a host name. Well, let's have a look what we can do now to make a first step in building our own container. Uh, my plan is uh, here to build a new container step by step and for every step I also create a new shell script that calls another shell script again. Uh, we get a couple of shells in this way that uh, are all the time uh, child processes of each other, uh, but that's just to show how it, how it works. So what we can do is that we can go and if you want to, to join, you can go to the directory cdd kit um, if you have that tar file and if you have unpacked the tar file. And in there you find the sub uh, directory mycont. And here we are going to cre uh, create all the steps to, to uh, start a new container. And the first step that we do, let's call it the script step one. And let's also, well, make it a nice script. Uh, the first thing that we do is uh, that we are going to do the command unshare minus u and then um, we are going to start a new script again. Yeah, let's call the command bash to execute script step two. This is all. Yeah, this is all that we want to do in script step one. Uh, unshare the UTS namespace and then let a new process uh, execute step two. And of course, that step two script has to be created as well. So let's also uh, create step two. And for now, um, we can first do uh, the command bash in here. Yeah, let's uh, just start an interactive shell. So what I can do now is that I once make the script executable, step one only, uh, because step two was created or executed explicitly with the bash command. And then I can do sudo start step one. Yeah, remember that we have to be root to create a new namespace. 
Well, then you can see the prompt of the new shell. And you can see in the prompt that it still has the same uh, name, uh, which is uh, MyCont, which was uh, also, uh, sorry, which is CentOS 9S, which was also the name of my uh, former uh, namespace. So it has got a copy of the UTS namespace with the same name, but I can change that copy. Yeah? And I can do it by Control D going out of this again, by changing the script step two. And before we start the bash, uh, I'm going to change the host name. And let's call it my container. And then execute the interactive bash. So again, I can start step one. And you can already see in the prompt of the new shell that it's called my container now. Yeah. So this new shell has its new environment uh, according to the host name. Okay, that's the first step in creating our container. Um, another namespace that we can uh, uh, use is the IPC namespace. Yeah, with, uh, I don't want to say too much about that. I have a small example here. Uh, but that's also used in, in most of the container implementations that uh, the processes running in the container get their own view on inter-process communication objects. Well, you might know that with the command IPCS, you can ask for all the inter-process communication objects. You can see the, the list of message queues and shared memory segments and semaphore arrays. And also here is valid if you do a sudo unshare minus i for IPC namespace and create a new shell in this case. I get the prompt of my new shell. And if I do the command IPCS there, you can see there are no uh, IPC uh, objects at all. Yeah, you have a complete blank environment. So no copy in this case, it, it behaves different from UTS. Uh, you get a blank uh, environment according to inter-process communication. <coughs> of course, via a standard command like IPC make, I can make a, a shared memory segment of uh, uh, one, uh, 4K in this case. case, and then I can do an IPCS again and I can see that there is now one shared memory uh, segment available for the processes that are in this namespace or connected to this namespace. So just as a brief example of what you can do with IPC namespaces. <clears throat> Let's have a look at PIT namespaces. A PIT namespace determines the PIT numbering. Yeah, for a PIT numbering scheme for a set of processes. If you think about containers, every container has its own PIT namespace and its own uh, yeah, PIT numbering scheme, starting by one again. PIT namespaces are nested. Uh, as you can see in this uh, example, here we see the PIT namespace, uh, which is connected to system D. System D itself has process ID one and the direct children have uh, two and five and four as their uh, PIDs and so on. At a certain moment, we will get a process that has the PID 17 in the root PIT namespace, as we call the, the outer namespace. Um, that process 17 might still fork off uh, a new process and gets PID 18 in the root namespace. But after that, process 17 might do an unshare and connect to a new PIT namespace. Yeah. And that's the red PIT namespace. And if it creates a new process, a child process afterwards, that child process gets a unique PIT number in the root uh, PIT namespace, but it also gets a PID in the new namespace. So this is a process, in fact, running with two PIDs in two different namespaces. 
Yeah, and uh, if that process forks their its own children again, you can see that every child gets a PIT number in the root namespace again, but also a free PIT number in the new child uh, PIT namespace in this uh, case. So um, you can even create a new namespace underneath so that every process gets three PIT numbers in three uh, different PIT namespaces. I think you can go to, to uh, 32 levels if you really want, yeah. if you see a use of that. So um, we can also visualize this. Remember that I started uh, the process sleep earlier. That was started inside a container. Yeah, that's um, uh, this bit number. Um, if I have a look here, less slash proc slash and then that pit number slash status, uh, then I'm looking at that status uh, pseudo file. And what you can find here yeah, is that this process, um, NS uh, pit, has a PID number in the root namespace, but you can also see its PID number in the uh, pit namespace of the container. Yeah, so that can be a row of PIT numbers that you get uh, in the order of the, the hierarchical order of the, the PIT namespaces. If you would look inside the container, uh, so only in that sub namespace, uh, then you only see this process runs with PID1. Beware that a process that runs with PID1 in a namespace, in any PID namespace, uh, that it has the same tasks as system D for the root namespace. Yeah, that also means that if one of the child processes uh, terminates uh, and is orphaned, uh, well, not orphaned, no, it terminates, then a process one in that PID namespace has to get rid of that process, not to get zombies. Yeah, so all that kind of tasks uh, is also valid if you start a process in a container uh, that that uh, first process that you really start has certain tasks not to get uh, zombie processes and that kind of things. Yeah, and such a process that runs with PID1 in a namespace uh, can also not be killed except via uh, the SIG kill uh, signal and the SIG stop signal, I think. So you cannot uh, get rid of it by control C, which sends signal 2, or by, by kill minus 15, that doesn't work. Uh, such a process really has to be killed only by uh, signal 9. Yeah. So, Let's have a look at an example of creating a new PIT namespace. What I can do is an unshare minus P to get a PIT namespace, but be aware if a process um, disconnects from the current PIT namespace, uh, the, the parent process itself cannot do that. Yeah, because then that process would suddenly get another PID in a new PIT namespace. And what you see is that if you unshare from the PIT namespace, then the child processes will be in that new PIT namespace, but the process itself will not be in the new PIT namespace. And that's why you see that here uh, we also use the minus minus fork option, which means that the, the command that I specify here, which is bash to, to be run uh, finally, that that command will run in a child yeah, and not overrule the unshare uh, executable itself in the, in the unshare process. So um, also realize that if you have a new PIT namespace, that the slash proc file system that holds all the PIT numbers as subdirectories yeah, should suddenly hold other PIT numbers of that new namespace. And therefore, you also have to give the option mi minus minus mine proc that the proc file system is newly mounted after being connected to the new PIT namespace. Yeah. Otherwise, you would still see the, the, the PITs in the, in the outer uh, PIT namespace. So finally, I started the bash here and I get the prompt of that bash in the new PIT namespace. I can do a sleep 300 to, to wait for five minutes in the background. And if I do a ps command, then I can see that bash itself runs with PID1 in this new bit namespace. 
I can see that Sleep 300 runs with PID 37 in this new PIP namespace, and PS itself it runs with 38. Yeah, so a total new PIP numbering uh, namespace and scheme. If I have a look in uh, slash proc from this shell, then I can see that there are subdirectories which are really called uh, 137 and in the meantime 39. Yeah, this is another command again. On the host system, I can still see the same process, the same bash process, but on the host system in the PID numbering space, it, it runs with an entire different PID. Yeah, and sleep also runs with a different PID in that namespace. So let's adapt our container for that. Um, so far, we have had the step one and step two. I leave the step one alone, and I'm going to modify this step two script that I created. And instead of running an interactive bash, I'm going to uh, run unshare. Minus p, minus minus fork, minus <coughs> minus mount dash proc. And uh, I'm going to run a new script by that. Yeah? Step three that we still have to create, of course. Yeah, and of course, it will also inherit uh, the formerly uh, created UTS namespace. So we can create a step three script here and start with bash. Yeah, just bash first. Interactive. So what I can do again is start from the beginning and execute step one again. And finally, the bash will uh, be started, the interactive bash. And you can still see it's uh, running in my container. It still has the uh, inherited uh, UTS namespace, but we can also see it's connected now to the new PIT namespace, uh, because you can see that all the processes are numbered here from, from one. Now, okay, that's the second step that we uh, have made in creating a container. So that's what we find here on this uh, on this slide, which you can do with your scripts. Let's have a look at an other namespace that we need, uh, and that's the network namespace for network isolation. Yeah, a network namespace determines what kind of interfaces are uh, in use. It also determines what kind of port numbers are open to which you can connect. Uh, it, it also determines uh, routes and uh, uh, firewall uh, rules and that kind of things. That's all related to a network namespace. And we have an initial network namespace that is connected to systemd. And we have all kinds of interfaces in there, a local loopback interface and an Ethernet interface and so on. And what we can do now is that from a process we can say, well, I inherit the connection to the initial uh, namespace, network namespace. I want to have a namespace of my own. I want to have my own networking stack created here. Yeah, and what we can see then is if you get a new namespace is that we get a namespace that only gets a local Lubick interface, which is even in down state. Yeah, and if you want to have more interfaces here, we uh, can create them afterwards. Uh, you can even assign physical interfaces to such a new namespace, but a physical interface can only be connected uh, or can only be part of one of the namespaces. So if you want to have this physical uh, Ethernet uh, name, uh, interface here, then you have to disconnect it from the initial namespace and, and get it here, but it's possible. Um, you can also interconnect namespaces, we will see that uh, in the meantime, by so-called VET pairs that you can uh, create to, to get a bridge between the two uh, network namespaces. Well, even some kernel parameters are namespaced. 
uh, if you think about kernel parameters like proxies, net, IP version 4, uh, unprivileged port start number, yeah, which is by default 1024. You you know the unprivileged port numbers uh, higher than 1024. Uh, you can modify such a parameter and put it on 512 like this, and realize is, uh, that you do that for the namespace to which your process is connected. Yeah, and that's a namespace kernel parameter, which can be different for all the namespaces. So also things like uh, forwarding and that kind of things, IP forward, can be set per network namespace. So suppose that um, I have my initial situation. I have a shell here that is um, a direct descendant of system D. And if I do the IP uh, adder uh, command, I can see my interfaces. And I'm looking at my initial network namespace at this moment. So what I can do now is that I do sudo unshare. I want to have a new network namespace and uh, I want to run a new bash uh, connected to that namespace. And then we get the prompt of the new bash, and then I can do IP other again in, uh, connected to that new namespace, and I can only see that there is a local Lubeck interface here, which is in the state down. Yeah, so what I can do here is that I can do IP link set device low to the up state, make it up, and then I can see it's up now. Uh, but if I look at the open ports, are there any uh, open TCP ports, for instance? Um, there are no open ports whatsoever, there are no established ports, uh, this is just an initial network namespace. Yeah, all the ports that were open uh, belong, so far belong to this initial namespace. So what I can do now is that I can set up a bridge between the two namespaces. Yeah, and that's what I can do with a so-called VET pair. Um, again, watch the, the colors here, uh, the color of the, the prompt. Uh, this is a prompt of a process connected to the initial network namespace. And there um, I can have a look at that shell that I just started on the previous slide. That shell uh, has this PID and I should know that that's a PID of a process connected to this namespace. Yeah, let's that have that clear. So what I can do now with the shell connected to the initial namespace is that I can do the command IP link add name my bridge zero type vet yeah and that will create the my bridge zero interface here peer name is my bridge one and connected to the namespace which is uh, connected to this process yeah and this is the process ID of my shell that is connected to the other namespace and there I get my MyBridge1 interface. And they will be interconnected, but they ha still have to be configured. Yeah, but now the interfaces are there. <coughs> Excuse me. So if I do an IP other now, being connected to this, this namespace, I can see the MyBridge0 uh, zero, my zero interface. I can initialize it and give it an uh, IP address uh, connected to this namespace and I can set it to the state up. Now I can go to my shell that is connected to this namespace and I can do the IP other command there and I can see, well, well I have a new interface here and I can also give it an IP address uh, and I can set it to the up state and once that has been settled then I can make an SSH connection or do a ping or whatever, uh, then from this new namespace, I can reach uh, the other namespace. Yeah, and if you take care that uh, nothing is configured uh, in this namespace, uh, then you can also reach from this namespace the outside world. Uh, and that's uh, uh, yeah, how it works with containers as well. That's the uh, idea. <coughs> So we can also do this uh, ourselves by getting another step again. Uh, step three, we will modify that into an unshare minus n and then do a bash of step four 
And then in step four, we'll start an interactive bash and see how the world looks like for that process. Um, yeah. Unshare uh, minus n. And then uh, run bash with step four. Yeah, that's what I modify in step three. That was the former uh, interactive bash. So then we are also going to create a step four script. And there I only start bash for the time being. So I can uh, start step one again to start from the beginning. Uh, and then I get my prompt which is uh, connected also to the new network namespace now. Um, if I do an IPA here, I can see indeed I didn't initialize anything yet. So I can see indeed there is only one uh, interface connected, which is the local loopback interface, which is in state down still. Um, and for the rest, yeah, if I have a look at uh, the open ports, I can see there are no open ports in this namespace yet. But we are going to, uh, to do some other steps in step four. And that's why you also downloaded the uh, tar file. Um, there is a skeleton for step four that also does the initialization that we really need to get a, a real network in our container. Um, let's have a look here. There is a step four skeleton here. And what I can do is that I simply can uh, copy it over the step four that I have at this moment that only starts the bash process interactively. I should do it here, that's better readable. So let's have a look what happens here in step four now. Of course, we have to uh, set the local loopback link up. And after that, I'm going to uh, create that VET pair. Yeah, but I have to do it from the perspective of the initial network namespace. So that's why I do an NS enter minus N. I uh, want to connect to an existing network namespace. And that should be the existing na network namespace of process one minus T1. But beware, this is not system D because we are already in a new PIT namespace. Uh, this is in fact the first uh, shell that I started in my PIT namespace, but that's still a shell connected to the original initial uh, network namespace. So that's fine. I can connect to that namespace. That's the initial network namespace. And there I can give the command IP link add name, that command that we saw on the slide before. Yeah. And that creates a MyBridge zero in the initial network namespace yeah, connected to process one. And it creates a MyBridge one in, well, I give my own PID of my running shell here. Yeah, which is in the new, connected to the new network namespace. And then I, the same way, I can also initialize the IP address of my bridge zero in the initial network namespace and put it up. After that, in my own shell, connected to the new namespace, I can also give my, uh, my half of the VET pair, I can give it an IP address and I can set it to state up. And after that, I start my interactive bash again. Yeah, to see how it looks like. Uh, can you repeat the question, please? Sorry, I... so, so PIT1, when you create your container, uh, PIT1, is that connected to the uh, initial... Uh, or oh, the PIT1, if it is still connected to the initial namespace? Exactly, yeah. Yes, it is. It is uh, still. It's the first process that has been started after uh, creating a new PIT namespace. And that creates a new bash again and a new bash again. So if we go back, uh, PIT1 is still connected to the initial network namespace. 
Uh, not by default, but in this case, because I first create a new pit namespace and then a new network namespace, I could have turned the order, of course, that I first created the network namespace, referring to PIT1 will then be system D, and then create a new PIT namespace. But uh, still in the new PIT namespace, uh, the first process is still connected to the initial network namespace. Yeah. So when I run this again, um, I can now see in my new container uh, that we have a local loopback interface which is up and I can see my bridge one uh, which also has its own IP address and um, yeah I can also reach 192.168.47.11 which is the IP address of my bridge zero in the initial network namespace. Yeah, so, a network has been set up now between the two namespaces. Okay, so we have a connected name, uh, network as well now. Let's have a look at the final namespace that I want to cover, and that's the, the mount namespace. Uh, the mount, space, mount namespace gives you an idea about uh, yeah, how does your file system look like, your logical file system structure, which is usually built up of various physical file systems that are mounted together. Um, also here you can say all the processes that are connected to the same namespace and that's also the namespace for instance the mount namespace that um, system D is connected to well they see a certain uh, view of the file system with all kind of directories and subdirectories spread over different physical file systems that are linked together that are mounted together. Uh, and uh, what we see here is that this was also the conventional approach. And you can see this, this file system structure if you do commands like mount and df. And for instance, the mount command uh, originally in Unix also always looks at slash etc slash mtap. Uh, and there, from there it can see what are the physical file systems that are in our logical file system tree. But you can see nowadays uh, in your system that this is a symlink to slash proc slash self and self is means my PID uh, slash mount info and uh, from there I get my information uh, now from DF and mount uh, about yeah, how my file system looks like and that can be for one process on the host it can be different from another process on the host uh, depending to which mount namespace you are connected yeah, it can be totally different. Um, if you create uh, a new mount namespace you will inherit, inherit the structure of the original mount namespace where you come from. Uh, but from then onwards, you can unmount things, uh, file systems, and you can mount new file systems uh, in your mount namespace, not influencing the original mount uh, namespace of, uh, to which system D and a lot of other processes are connected. Yeah, and by that, every process can have its own view about what is my file system and how does it look like. Yeah, it's even uh, very um, uh, nice that suppose that you have a lot of processes that have an open file in this file system and it's impossible to unmount it because you get device busy, that if you create a new mount namespace, that you can unmount it in the new uh, file system namespace, even if processes here have open files in that physical file system. Yeah, so that kind of th things are, are possible. So let's have a look at an example of that. Um, if I look at my current file system with uh, a command like df, I can see there are a couple of uh, uh, physical uh, file systems put together at certain mount points. If I do an unshare minus m and I start a new shell, here I get the prompt of my new shell. And what I can simply do is unmount slash data and I can mount another uh, uh, file system from my second uh, disk partition, uh, for, from partition one of my second disk and mount it to slash m and t. And if I look at df now for my file system view, I can see that it looks like this. Yeah? Uh, totally independent of the original uh, mount namespace. 
And if I exit from this environment again, and I'm back in the original environment, I can see that the file system still looks like uh, yeah, these mount points that I originally had. Uh, that will be unmounted, yes. Yes, because I'm the last process that was connected to that mount namespace. That also means that things will be unmounted that were mounted there. So, let's modify the uh, container that we have so far. Uh, remember that step four was copied and ended with an interactive bash here. Well, we are going to change that line to unshare minus m bash step five and create a step five script. Um, step four has to be modified for this. And here we can say um, unshare minus n bash step five. And obviously, then we have to make a step five script that for this moment we only fill with an interactive bash. So again, let's start step one. And uh, well, we almost have a rather mature container now. Uh, I can do a DF and see uh, that a lot of things have been inherited. I'm still wondering about that far lob lob lip docker there at the end, but I didn't expect it. Uh, a lot of things have, uh, uh, are inherited, uh, like, like the file system, but I can manipulate with it myself now. Uh, for instance, I can do an uh, umount uh, slash boot or whatever I like uh, without influencing the uh, original mount namespace. That kind of things can be done. Uh, still, if I look at the host name, I can still see we have our own host name. We have our own bit numbering here, although we have got some, uh, a lot of processes in the meantime by all the steps. Uh, and we have our own uh, network yeah, dedicated for this uh, process. All right. There's one thing that I want to mention, uh, last thing about namespaces. Uh, namespaces vanish at the moment that all the connected processes have stopped. Yeah, then they automatically disappear. But you can make persistent namespaces. And that is possible if you bind mount a file name to a namespace then even if all the connected processes have disappeared, then the namespace will still be there. And later on, you can still connect to it uh, again. You can preserve it uh, in a way. Yeah, this is, uh, for instance, the technique that is also used by the command IP net NS. Maybe you've ever used that or use it. Uh, that also uses this technique of uh, persistent namespaces. Uh, let's have a look how that works. If I uh, do a sudo unshare minus, uh, minus uts or minus u, that's also possible, and uh, get me a new bash. Uh, then I can modify uh, the host name there. But what I can do as well now is that I can create a dummy file yeah, just by a touch and bind mount uh, with mount minus minus bind sproc self ns uts to that dummy file. And now I can finish my shell that would normally also uh, let the UTS namespace disappear, this UTS namespace. Uh, but now it is connected to a file and it will be preserved. You can also do this uh, instead of doing it yourself with a touch and a mount uh, minus minus bind. You can also ask Unshare to do this. This is built in into Unshare. Uh, on beforehand, I create a dummy file. And then I do an unshare minus minus UTS is slash temp slash permuts. And now this will be done by uh, the unshare command itself. It will be connected to a file, but also to this process. And here I can modify the hostname again and exit the process while the file is still there. Yeah, if I want to use it later on again, 
then I can do the command nsenter, and there I can specify minus minus uts is slash tem slash parameters. Remember, usually we use the minus t flag with a PID, but now we specify a file name. And that means that the new bash will be connected um, instead of to its old uh, current UTS namespace, it will be connected to the namespace that we have preserved from an earlier session. Yeah. And then in that namespace, I can uh, do, uh, in that shell, I can do hostname and see the hostname of uh, that namespace that was still existing. Okay. Just uh, as a final slide for the namespaces part, uh, let's have a look at how it is correlates to, for instance, Docker. Um, you see with Docker, if you do Docker run, that you can have uh, uh, specify a lot of parameters and a lot of them also correlate to the namespaces part. What you can do with the Docker run, uh, normally the container gets its own UTS namespace, but you can say minus minus UTS is host. And that means just keep using the host namespace. Yeah. Um, you can also say minus minus UTS is container and then another container ID which means, in fact, that it does a kind of uh, NS enter under the hood, uh, NS enter to that container and share the UTS namespace with that other container that you specify here by the container ID. Yeah, and similarly, you can do that for uh, bit isolation. You can say minus minus bit is host, and then your processes in the container will still have high bit numbers that are also used for the, for the other processes in the host instead of getting its own uh, bit namespace. Yeah, and you can also share with another running container the, the bit numbering, uh, the bit number scheme yeah, by doing bit is container colon container ID. Similarly, you can do minus minus network is host. I don't want to give my process in the container its own networking namespace. It should just use the namespace, networking namespace of the host or should uh, share the networking namespace with another container. That's also possible. And similarly for IPC isolation. With the command docker run, you can also specify, and that's the same example that I gave you earlier in the slides, minus minus CTL is, uh, and then net IP version 4 and so on, that namespaced kernel parameters can also be influenced when you start a new container. So with a network um, equal container, multiple containers can share the same physical network device. Yes, um, the question is, um, can multiple containers share the same physical network device? And then you mean apart from the, the, the root uh, network, which is not used by the root network namespace? Uh, yes, that's correct. Yeah. And that means also here with network container and then a certain container ID that more containers can have the same networking uh, namespace uh, and by that also see the same port numbers and they can also easily reach each other just by referring to local host because they are in the same network namespace. So that's, that's possible uh, with this option of Docker Run. Yeah, they are connected to the same network namespace that even can have a physical uh, interface of its own, yeah. Okay, we have our own network name, uh, our own um, mount namespace now uh, in, in the container that we are building, but that's still the entire file system that we have there. Uh, and it should not have access to the entire file system. Uh, my container should have a, a small file system of its own, yeah, a mini file system. So let's have a look what we can do about that still. Well, what we can see, and that's already an old mechanism that, that's already used in Unix for decades, is that you can uh, influence the root directory uh, for a particular process. Yeah, there is not such a thing as the root directory for the entire file system. Every process has its own idea of what is my root directory in the file system. 
Um, that's also what you see underneath slash proc slash and then a PID. Then you can find also root as a symlink to the real root directory for this process. So you can even see it from the outside that certain processes have their own ID about what is my root directory. Yeah, so most of the processes will see the root directory of the entire file system as their root directory. But you can say, well, let's create in some corner of my file system, let's create uh, a directory structure with uh, an etc directory and a bin directory and uh, uh, a home directory and that kind of things underneath and let's fill the bin directory with a couple of um, executables commands and so on and from now on i start a new process that gets this directory as its root directory yeah and all that process sees is this directory and everything underneath and this process cannot even reach the other part of the host file system. Yeah, and that's a technique which is already very old with the change root mechanism, but there are also newer um, uh, variations of that, like pivot root. Um, there is a change between the old change root mechanism and pivot root. Uh, change root uh, activates a new process, one process with a prepared uh, directory as its root directory. Uh, if you use pivot root, and we will use that later on in the, uh, the example that I'm building, uh, it ch uh, changes the root directory for a couple of processes in a certain mount namespace. Yeah, so this is namespace related again. All the processes connected to a certain mount namespace will from now on uh, use another root directory in that namespace. Well, of course, you have to set up such a corner in your file system uh, that you will use as the file system later on for a certain process or a couple of processes. So, very briefly, I can do a make there of a directory called top there, create a bin directory, a lib64 directory, an etc directory, and a root directory underneath uh, as a minimum. Uh, then we have to fill those directories. Uh, let's copy the slash bin and slash bash to top there bin. Yeah, to get a couple of commands in that new um, environment. Uh, echo, create a line that I, uh, that I write to the top directory etc password file. Just create a small password file. And I create a small uh, .bash profile for root. You can see that slash root is the root, uh, is the home directory of, uh, of the root user in this case. Of course, I copy here two binaries into top their bin, but those binaries might use shared libraries. So with the LDD command, I can determine what are the shared libraries being used by slash bin bash and cat that I copied. Well, here I can see them and I copy those shared libraries to lib64 in that new environment. Yeah, and by that I have set up this, uh, this new root directory. Well, what we see here is um, an example of using change root command. Uh, sudo, do the change root command. The first parameter that I specify is that new root directory that I want to use. And then the process that I will start that is going to be uh, assigned to that root directory. And then I can see my prompt, my new prompt. And I can do an ls minus l. Well, that doesn't exceed because I didn't copy the ls command slash bin, only cut and bash have been copied in the example before. Uh, but of course I can see the files that I have here with echo slash uh, asterisk. Echo is a shell built in, so that will succeed. Um, and then I can also see what kind of things are underneath uh, slash bin, and I can see my slash bin slash cut anyhow. Uh, and I can also do a cut of each password. I can use cut. You have a question? Is no. chroot changing the, the namespace for that, uh, so bash in this example, or is it using some other mechanism? It uses another mechanism, okay. yes. So you could potentially somehow, you can still see the like root process namespace. Yes, uh, the, the, of course, uh, this, this process is also connected to a mount namespace, but this root directory is given to this specific process. Yeah. Um, so that it has its own root directory in 
yeah, in its own mount namespace, but it doesn't influence the other processes in that uh, connected to that name. It does have its own mount namespace. Every process has a mount namespace. Gotcha. Yeah, uh, even uh, uh, the the mount namespace to which system D is connected. So that's where all processes are connected to if they don't separate from that mount namespace and create their own. Gotcha. Yeah, every process is connected to all those uh, namespaces. Yeah. Yeah, of course, PS is not possible, but echo dollar dollar, I can still see the PID of my shell and so on. Yeah. So here we see an, uh, an example of changed root being used, uh, but in uh, container techniques, mostly pivot root is used as a command. And with pivot root, you can modify the root directory for a mount namespace yeah, and all the processes that are connected to that. Uh, so pivot root, and here you can specify the new uh, root directory. And what was the former root directory will be automatically uh, uh, moved to what you specify as the old root directory. Yeah, and everything which is under old root, you can unmount and so on. You don't need it anymore. And then you can work with your new root directory. Uh, there is a limitation here that this new root directory must be a mount point. Yeah, it must be the mount point of a mounted file system. Then you can use it as the new root directory. So I cannot simply um, uh, change it in this example. Instead of doing change root, do a pivot root. Because uh, top there is not a mount point. It's just a directory somewhere in the file system. So what we can do is that we can extend now the, uh, the example again. Uh, I had an empty step 5 so far, which only started bash. Yeah, that looked like this. Um, but I have a skeleton now that I can use as a new step 5. So let's uh, uh, move it, step 5, scale to step 5. And let's have a look at uh, how it looks like, step 5 now. So what we see here is that I uh, specify just uh, a directory, a uh, new root, as a shell variable. I check if it already exists, and if not, it will be created. Yeah? So anyhow, I will create the directory new root. And now I'm going to mount uh, a tempfs file system of 50 megabytes to that new root directory. Yeah, because it must be a mount point, I'm going to use pivot root, and that's why I do it this way. I connect a, temp, a tempfs file system to it. And now I rsync the contents of this directory into that directory, uh, so that it will be the, the filling of the new mounted tempfs file system. Well, I will show you the scalefs. That's just similar to what we, what we created earlier with a bin directory underneath and an etc directory underneath, and that kind of things. Yeah, and after that, I do a CD to that new root directory, to new root, and then I do a pivot root. And I specify the current directory, which is new root, as the new root directory. And what was my root directory will be moved to old root. And that should be an existing directory under which the, the old uh, tree will be mounted, uh, will be moved to, I should say. Um, if I am in a new tree, I should also remount the proc directory again. And I can also specify my, my uh, prompt uh, string again for the bash that I'm going to start from, from now on. So this is how the, the new step five uh, looks like. So what I can do is uh, start all over with uh, step one again. And then we will see here that if I do a DF in the new environment, that all the old contents of my file system that I had before has been moved to old root. Yeah, and um, that can all be unmounted now, but that still has to be done. And I will not do it here, but uh, that still has to be done in practice. And you can see that we have a new root directory, which is my file system of uh, 50 megabytes now, uh, containing uh, a small tree. Yeah. And this is in fact also the idea of uh, yeah, getting your mini file system uh, for your container. Of course, this is not an overlay file system. That's another story that I, I won't handle here. Uh, but uh, this is the, the new file system, the mini file system for the new container. Yeah. Is it 
Um, the question is, is this a new file system or is it still part of the old file system? Uh, you have seen in my script, <coughs> sorry, that I, um, that I did a mount of an MKFS file system and that I copied the, the contents of some directory into it. Um, so, yeah, that... that, uh, that Yeah, the question is uh, how about file permissions? Can other processes also still work in the, the, the root file system of this uh, process? Yes, they can. Uh, what you have seen before I did the pivot root is that I mounted a uh, tempfs file system on new root and all the other processes that can uh, reach new root can also modify the things that are uh, modified here by this process in, in, in this container. Yeah, so. It's a shared file system, only the process in this container cannot go above the, uh, the current uh, directory, uh, this root directory, while the other processes that were running uh, in an other mount space or whatever can still uh, well, be everywhere in the file system. Yeah. Other question? Uh, it sounds more like a water. Like when you, for example, you can give to a certain user maximum space that can allocate. Oh, okay. So this is to a namespace. Yes, the, 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 the free space in the file system is, uh, is not limited here. Uh, so this process running in this container container, uh, can still use uh, all the free uh, file system space and also cause troubles for other uh, processes running in other namespaces. Uh, so, well, in this case, it's, it's a tempfs, so, um, but if you would change root, uh, would use change root, then uh, you can still use all the free space in, uh, in the original file system. Here I created a tempfs file system of 50 megabytes. Yeah, so that's really the limit uh, what I can use from here. There was another question. Yeah. And the question is, instead of copying all the, um, the, the commands and the shared libraries and so on, is it uh, possible to create a link? Uh, not a sim link or a hard link, but you can do things with bind mounting. Oh, okay. yeah, and that's also often used uh, in, in, in container techniques, that certain things are bind mounted from the host file system into the file system of a container, so that you can still use it. Other question? Yeah. You can still do bind mounting here yes. after doing a pivot route. So the question is, if you are here in this process, in this environment, can you still do bind mounting? That is possible, yes, that would be possible. But then you still share the things with the processes that are running, uh, other processes that are running on the host. Yeah, but it's still possible to do bind mounting instead of this. Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> there were some questions, uh, it's fine. Um, I have four slides, last four slides, that are about another thing. And that is uh, capabilities, yeah. uh, which is also a, a last technique that I want to mention when we deal with uh, containers. Uh, if we have a look at the traditional Unix privilege scheme, then we see traditionally that if you have a process that runs with UID 0, yeah, practically the root user, uh, then that process has all the 
special privileges there are. Yeah, you can restart or reboot the system, you can modify the hardware clock, you can kill any process, uh, that kind of things uh, are allowed then. If you have a process not running with UID0, uh, a normal user, then you have no special privileges at all. Yeah, that's the traditional scheme. Well, the Linux privilege scheme, uh, there we can see that they have introduced capability mechanism in the kernel. And capabilities means that every special privilege that is normally meant for a root user is a certain bit in a bit list. And if that bit is set, you can do that special privilege. If your corresponding bit is not set, you cannot do that privilege. And um, all these distinct privileges that are translated into bits uh, have names like can you do a change own, can you do a kill, can you reboot the system, can you give a process a higher than normal um, uh, nice value, uh, well I should say a lower nice value which means a higher priority. So all these special uh, privileges that are normally assigned to a root user are distinct bits in fact. And uh, if you want to know more ab about it, you can uh, look at chapter 7 of capabilities for that. What you see in the kernel code nowadays is that there is no check anymore if you do a special system call. Is the current process running as UID0? No, there is a check. Uh, is this certain bit set in the current process's administration? Then the process is allowed to do this. Yeah, and that means that you even can give normal users special privileges. And you can even have a root user that has no privileges at all. It all depends which bits are set in the capability list in the process's administration. Yeah, that determines what the process is allowed to do as special privilege. So we can see uh, these privileges and there's a lot to tell about this and I'm not going to do that. The only thing that I uh, want to look at is the effective uh, capabilities, as the name says. That is really effective, that bit list. And you can see that bit list again in that status file, that pseudo file status, underneath the uh, slash proc slash PID and so on status. Uh, one of the last lines in that file uh, say cap effective, and that's a hexadecimal value of that bit list that determines which of the special privileges are assigned to you and which are not assigned to you. Uh, and you can see that my own shell running as a normal user, uh, cap effective, all the bits are uh, not set. And if you, for instance, have a look at process one, system D, which is also running on, under UID zero, but it's not in fact relevant. Uh, there you can see that a lot of bits, in fact, all the bits are set here yeah, as a hexadecimal value. Well, if you have downloaded the tar file, you will find um, a special uh, program, which is called capshow as one command. And there you can see uh, that it uh, takes all these values out of these status files and you can uh, have an overview about all the processes and their effective capabilities. Well, you might wonder specifically here you see a lot that have all the capabilities, but there are also processes that do not have all capabilities. They have a number of capabilities. Uh, let's have a look at uh, 739, yeah, which is a rootkit uh, daemon, just an arbitrary process. Uh, if we have a look at that process, where's my mouse? Uh, this one, for instance, it has certain capability set. Well, you can, with CapShow, also ask for a particular process. And uh, then you can still also have a look at the human readable format, uh, which means that it really translates all the bits into uh, the verbs that we saw earlier on the earlier slide. Yeah, so you can exactly see what is allowed. Uh, and you will see, if I have a look here at the sleep process, all the processes uh, calling sleep, you can see here that uh, this process, remember it was started via docker run, you can see that it doesn't have all the capabilities, but it has some capabilities. Yeah. And it, it has some special privileges. I'll come back to that later on. Yeah, so um, 
this de really determines what the process is allowed to do. And um, that's also uh, uh, the scenarios that you can have nowadays, that you can have a non-root process that still has capabilities or root processes that have no capabilities at all. Yeah, that's independent of the UID. Uh, there are still, for compatibility reasons, uh, the, the fact that if you change to root, that all the capabilities will be set. But from that moment on, uh, onwards, you can uh, remove certain capabilities again, if you want. Yes? Uh, when did that change actually happen? Like, what version of... In the kernel? Yeah. All, already a long time ago. Oh, really? I think already in 2.6, but I'm not sure about it. Yeah. It's already for a decade or even more. Yeah. yeah, but you won't notice because of the compatibility that if you switch to root that all the capabilities will be set. But um, it's under the hood, it works like this. Yeah. So as a final slide, how does this correlate to, for instance, Docker, Docker run command? Um, what you can see is that they have uh, specified a distinct set of capabilities specifically for Docker containers. Uh, so if your process in a Docker container runs as root, it doesn't mean that all the capabilities are set, but only this set of capabilities is set. Yeah, and that means, for instance, the kill capability means that you can kill any process. But is that a problem if it is within the container bit namespace? Yeah, so um, certain things are not even bad that they are set, but uh, of course there's a lot to do about uh, security in this, in this case. Uh, you can also influence these uh, capabilities by docker run cap add, and you can even assign more capabilities than this well-defined set, or you can do a minus minus cap drop and drop some of these capabilities and adapt it to your own needs. Yeah, you don't uh, have to stick to the, the set that has been defined here. Uh, what is dangerous is if you do a docker run minus minus privileged. Uh, that means that you get all the capabilities. And that also means that you get uh, unrestricted device access, which is, of course, uh, uh, a security risk. Right, uh, that's the last slide. And we have had already some questions uh, during the session. Uh, and I'm afraid it's... Uh, Five minutes past half, so we have to finish. I want to thank you for being here and for listening to me.